Hey guys, I welcome you all for today's module in Crash Sports and Energy, brought to you by the Energy Club of IIT Bombay. I am Yash and I will be your instructor for today's module on battery technology. So without further ado, let's get started. Before moving on to the look and crash of the topic, I would like to give you an overview on what general themes we will be picking today. At the start, I would shed a bit of light upon why do we actually need an energy storage in the first place. After which, we will dive a bit into the basic working and technicalities of the battery. And then, we move on to talk about the past, the present and the future of the battery industry. When I talk about the need for energy storage, there are five points that I would like to stress upon. The first is an access to portability. Look around you. The cell phones that you carry in your pocket, the car you drive, each appliance inherently requires it to be portable and not connected to a socket all the time. And this is what energy storage allows you. Next up is storage in case of energy production. You don't use up all the energy generated by your power plant at a single go. Rather, you can't. That's where energy storage comes in handy. Also, when we talk about household appliances, you usually get the electricity to drive it from the service mains connected to the electrical grid. In this scenario, the presence of an energy storage allows you to stay off the grid, get energy from various sources at a single time, for example solar or wind, and also get a consistent supply of energy from various sources that you might end up using, making it an important element in an ecosystem driven by renewable energy, which are usually intermittent, intermittent and relatively smaller in scale. There are various ways of energy storage like mechanical, electrical. But in this module, we will specifically, we will specifically be talking about electrochemical storage and in it mainly battery. Now that we have gotten a good enough grip on the idea about why we actually need energy storage, let's look into what are batteries, how do they work and the parameters that it showcases. I would like to start off this topic with a short video. You probably know the feeling. Your phone utters its final plaintive bleep and cuts out in the middle of your call. In that moment, you may feel more like throwing your battery across the room than singing its praises. But batteries are a triumph of science. They allow smartphones and other technologies to exist without anchoring us to an infernal tangle of power cables. Yet even the best batteries will diminish daily, slowly losing capacity until they finally die. So why does this happen? And how do our batteries even store so much charge in the first place? It all started in the 1780s with two Italian scientists, Luigi Galvani and Alessandro Volta and a frog. Legend has it that as Galvani was studying a frog's leg, he brushed a metal instrument up against one of its nerves, making the leg muscles jerk. Galvani called this animal electricity, believing that a type of electricity was stored in the very stuff of life. But Volta disagreed, arguing that it was the metal itself that made the leg twitch. The debate was eventually settled with Volta's groundbreaking experiment. He tested his idea with a stack of alternating layers of zinc and copper, separated by paper or cloth soaked in a saltwater solution. What happened in Volta's cell is something chemists now call oxidation and reduction. The zinc oxidizes, which means it loses electrons, which are in turn gained by the ions in the water in a process called reduction, producing hydrogen gas. Volta would have been shocked to learn that last bit. He thought the reaction was happening in the copper rather than the solution. Nonetheless, we honor Volta's discovery today by naming our standard unit of electric potential, the volt. This oxidation reduction cycle creates a flow of electrons between two substances. And if you hook a light bulb or vacuum cleaner up between the two, you'll give it power. Since the 1700s, scientists have improved on Volta's design. They've replaced the chemical solution with dry cells filled with chemical paste. But the principle is the same. A metal oxidizes, sending electrons to do some work before they are regained by a substance being reduced. But any battery has a finite supply of metal. And once most of it has oxidized, the battery dies. So rechargeable batteries give us a temporary solution to this problem by making the oxidation reduction process reversible. Electrons can flow back in the opposite direction with the application of electricity. Plugging in a charger draws the electricity from a wall outlet that drives the reaction to regenerate the metal, making more electrons available for oxidation the next time you need them. But even rechargeable batteries don't last forever. Over time, the repetition of this process causes imperfections and irregularities in the metal's surface that prevent it from oxidizing properly. The electrons are no longer available to flow through a circuit, and the battery dies. Some everyday rechargeable batteries will die after only hundreds of discharge recharge cycles, while newer advanced batteries can survive and function for thousands. Batteries of the future may be light thin sheets that operate on the principles of quantum physics and last for hundreds of thousands of charge cycles. But until scientists find a way to take advantage of motion to recharge your cell battery, like cars do, or fit solar panels somewhere on your device, plugging your charger into the wall, rather than expending one battery to charge another, is your best bet to forestall that fatal bleep. Now 
that you have seen this video, I guess you have gotten a pretty general idea of what a battery is and what it does. In its crux, a battery has three fundamental components, a cathode, an anode, and an electrolyte, with or without a separator. The cathode is the region where reduction reaction takes place, an anode is where oxidation takes place, and the separator brings about a separation between the cathode and, the, and an anode, so that a charge gradation a charge gradient is maintained and an external circuit is required to again bring about this scenario of charge balance. Batteries are classified into two classes based upon its reversibility. Primary batteries are the ones which can cause only one uh, one sided reaction like a zinc carbon dry cell, dry cell while secondary batteries can reverse their process by a swap of connection, connection terminals thus in a sense refueling the electrodes. Looking into the chemical aspects of the battery, the electrical potential or its voltage is determined by what is known as the Nernst equation. For each electrode, that is, either the cathode or the anode, this equation says that its electrode potential or voltage of that terminal, in a rough sense, is equal to the difference between the reactant's standard electrode potential and this product here, that is, RT by NF into natural log of Q. Here R represents the real gas constant. The temperature is determined by uh, is shown by T. N shows the number of moles of electrons transferred, and F is the Faraday's constant. While Q, while Q is the reaction quotient of the given reaction, that is, how much proportion of the reactant and the product is present. So all in all, what it, what this equation shows is how far or how close it is from the equilibrium concentration and thus the equilibrium um, electrode potential. Now if we we'll go on to uh, go on looking further, here we have uh, an oxidation rea oxidation reaction wherein zinc is converted into Zn2+. Its its standard electrode potential is 0.76 volt, while copper is go getting reduced where its standard potential is 0.34 volt. Now, we get the voltage of this battery by combining both this reaction, reduction and the oxidation half. That is, the standard electron potential of a zinc copper battery would be 1.1 volt. The reversibility of this reaction, the reversibility of this battery is determined by a variable known as the Gibbs free, const, Gibbs free energy constant. This determines whether the battery will either be reversible, that is secondary, or primary, that is irreversible. After this, we move on to the battery parameters. These are the battery parameters that we will be covering point by point in the, in the next few slides. The first parameter we will be talking about is battery capacity. So battery capacity is the measure of charge or the measure of energy stored in a battery. And it has various units. For example, watt hour or kilowatt hour when we are measuring energy, and ampere hour when we are measuring charge. Uh, ampere hour is the more usually used unit, just because of the fact that voltage over a long period of time doesn't remain constant, and thus we get a crude sense of uh, battery capacity when we are talking in terms of energy rather than an accurate sense. Now this charge or uh, now this charge or battery capacity depends on active mass of the material. Now the active mass of the material means the material which is which can still undergo reaction and give about electrons. However, we, actually, we also need to make sure that the energy storage capabilities of a battery can vary significantly from the nominal or the maximum rated capacity or the maximum rated capacity as the battery capacity depends on much other factors such as age and past history of the battery for example how many charges has it run already or for how much depth of discharge has it re reached which we will cover in the later halves and the temperature as we know as the temperature increases the kinetic energy of electrons increases thus at a higher temperature we get a higher battery capacity while at a lower temperature since the electrons are at a lower energy we might get a lower battery capacity now moving on to battery charging and discharging parameters, there are different terms that we need to remember. The first is the battery state of charge. What it basically means is, to the, compared to the full extent charge of the battery, how much the battery is charged right now. 
that is the charge present that is it is basically a ratio of the charge present in the battery to the full charge that it can possess a common way to measure the battery state of charge is basically to measure the voltage of the battery right now and to compare it to the voltage of a fully charged battery but this is a very crude this is in a very crude manner as the state of charge depends also on another another other factors such as the current and the temperature of the battery a similar similar to the state of charge there is another inversely proportional to it a, a term which is the depth of discharge the depth of discharge is the maximum fraction of power that we can actually extract from a battery for example each uh, for example a lead acid battery from a lead acid battery we can maximum output only 50% of energy that is other 50% cannot be used now nearly all batteries now nearly all batteries particularly for renewable energy applications are rated in terms of their capacity with the depth of discharge this is just because it shows us how many charge and discharge cycles that we can cause about in that battery now similar to the depth of discharge there is another term which is daily depth of discharge this is the fraction of power that can be withdrawn from the battery on a daily basis unlike the depth of discharge which was not on a timely basis per se talking about battery discharge rate the notation for providing battery this capacity as a function of time is cx equal to z where x is the number of hours it takes for the battery to discharge to a capacity z that is z is the battery capacity after x hours and when we talk about discharge rate it is given by dividing this value by the number of hours it by the number of hours it is discharged for for example if a battery with the capacity c is discharged for 10 hours then its discharge rate might be written as 0.1c consequently if there is a specification as c20 by 10 then it means that a battery to reach z amount of its capacity requires 20 hours but rather than 20 hours it has been discharged for 10 hours thus its notation becomes 0.1c20 now talking about the ch charging rate it is the amount given to the battery per unit time now if you want to discharge a battery of 500 ampere hour in 20 hours then the discharge rate considering constant current would be 25 ampere and furthermore if you consider there is a battery that um battery that gives about 12 volt con consequently the power being delivered to the load is about 25 ampere into 12 volt that is 300 volt 300 watt now moving on to battery charging and discharging parameters every battery has its own specific charging and discharging regime and constraints what this means is uh, what this means is the battery voltage changes differently for each kind of battery with regards to its depth of discharge for example we can see in the graph that a lead acid battery its voltage reduces linearly while the lithium ion battery its voltage remains stable till about 80% depth of discharge and then it drops significantly also we will also charging and discharging current vary from battery to battery now there are different constraints that we need to look forward that we need to look to look about when we talking about batteries and we are talking about reusing them for example nickel cadmium batteries every time we use it we need to completely discharge it before charging it while lead acid batteries as we saw earlier they can never be fully discharged talking about battery efficiency we have three types of battery first is coulomb efficiency this relates to the charge now coulombic efficiency and its core is the ratio of the charge extracted to the charge input uh, usually it is above 95% because the losses that come in in this case are primarily due to loss in charge due to secondary reactions that might happen in the battery while voltage efficiency is simply v in by v out by v in that is how much voltage is output to the ratio of voltage input uh, this This is determined largely by the voltage difference between the charging voltage that is the voltage we used to charge while the battery voltage during discharge. Now talking about energy and power density there are two kinds of densities. First up is gravimetric energy density. This is when we divide the energy by on a uh, this is when we consider energy in a on a per kg basis while volumetric energy density is when we consider energy on a per liter basis. 
Similarly, if we go on for power instead of energy, we get a power density. Now, battery life. These are divided into two halves. Two halves or two categories. The first is number of cycles. Now, battery lifetime in number of cycles is showcased as the number of charge discharge cycles, that is, one time charging and one time discharging, that the battery can undergo. This is used in consumer electronics or appliances that are used on a daily basis. For example, your cell phones or your laptops. Whereas the other division is shelf life, or for batteries which aren't used significantly or are used for a particular time, for example, in an inverter. Now talking about battery voltage, the voltage when it is in equilibrium or it is an open on circuit, it is typically known as nominal battery voltage or the maximum voltage the battery can supply. Usually this nominal battery voltage cannot be readily measured because it is dependent on more factors than we know of. But for practical battery systems, the open load circuit or when no terminals connected to any circuit is a good enough approximation. Now this voltage usually appro approximates to about 2 volt for a single cell. We can stack these cells in series to form a, uh, to, to increase the voltage. Now the cutoff voltage is the minimum voltage to which the battery can be discharged or beyond which if we discharge the battery, the, the battery starts getting deteriorated. Now voltage variation with, with discharging, due to polarization and concentration effects, voltage changes during discharge conditions. This is the fact that because of the charge transfer, there are some reverse reactions happening in the cell, which cause about re reduction in the actual voltage while sub, uh, during discharge conditions. Now let's look into some more parameters regarding battery. First is the internal series resistance. As the name says, this is the internal resistance of a battery and determines the max current that can outflow from a battery and thus keeps the circuit safe. The second is the self discharge current. Even in open load conditions, when no terminal is connected to any circuit, the battery still undergoes a discharge reaction and thus a, ch a charge is lost and a self discharge current is generated, which reduces the battery capacity. Now the third part and the last part in bat battery parameters is the cold cranking current. This is the maximum amount of current a battery can provide for a short period of time. Such kind of property is widely used or looked upon in automobile batteries which require a large amount of current in a short amount of time. Here is a simple chart mentioning all the widely known batteries that are in use right now and the different parameters regarding it that we discussed just before this. You can look you can pause the slide here and look into it nicely.